So, today I want to talk to you about vocation. When I was still very young, um, I was born in the uh, in the country of Guatemala. And when I was still very young, I remember this man would come to our home and would look at every single one of us, the siblings, and uh, he would say, hey, you are going to be a doctor and you are going to be a lawyer. And I remember clearly, I remember that he would look at me and would say, hey, but you are going to be a pilot. <laughs> I don't know why, but this has stuck with me. This memory, it's always been there for me. But this prediction is ironic because while I do like flying, I am afraid of heights. It's interesting, right? That as, I, as we grew up, we are constantly being asked this question. What is it that you want to do when you grow up? I know I was. What are you going to do when you grow up? Today, I want to touch on the subject of vocation. Because making a life is better than making a living. Listen to me. Making a life is better than making a living. You, now point number one, listen to this very carefully. The point number one that I want to make is that you are called to create. Sounds interesting, right? Let's read Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and on. All right, so if you can pick up your Bible wherever you might be at today in the comfort or of your home, pick up your Bible and let's read Genesis. We're going to open the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and on. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was in the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I want to stop there for a second. Notice here that when God approaches earth, it says that it had nothing in it except water. It had no form, that it was just darkness and not much to admire about it. God looks at it and it says to himself, let's do something about this. Let's fix this. Let's, cre let's get creative and transform this nothing into something amazing. And I can imagine the Lord rolling up his sleeve to get to work. So in verse 3, it goes on to say... Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. Hmm. Here is God's first idea in the creation step. Light. And in verse 4 it says, and God saw the light that it was good. Hmm. And God divided the light from darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Look at that. It actually, I, I, can imagine, I can imagine the Lord saying, man, light actually looks good. <laughs> and that's all God did in the first day. He named the darkness night and the light day. And that was the first day of creation week. On the second day, he separates the waters above from the waters under. And he makes the atmosphere. And on the third day, land appears. On the fourth day, the sun, moon, and stars appear. On the fifth day, all the animals of the water and birds of the air come to be. And on the sixth day, not only the animals of the land come to be, but also mankind. And I bring all of this up because I want to highlight, highlight two things here. One it's God creativity is in action during the creation week. He is the creator and he rolls up his sleeve to create, to work. Listen to me. All right, that's number one. And number two, verse 26 of chapter one of Genesis says the following. Listen to this. God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. 
All right, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created them, the Bible says. Do you know what this means? You and I been, have been made in the likeness of the Almighty God. That you and I have characteristics, gifts, talents, personalities that God himself has. One of those things that I want to highlight is the divine gift of co-participating in creating. Listen to this. More specifically, I'm talking about vocation. Did you know that you, when you post on Facebook, when you post on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Snapchat, and any other social media platform, do you know what they call you? They call you content creator. When I first saw that, that, that I was being addressed as creator, it kind of bothered me a little bit, you know, because the first thing that came to mind was like, hey, excuse me, only God is the creator. <laughs> but as I was having a conversation with someone, I realized that if God is a creator and we have been made in his image and in his likeness, man, then that means that we have been gifted with the ability to create with the ability to participate in creation. And with that gift comes a calling from God, comes your vocation. Let me give you an example. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. Look at this. The Bible says the following. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right. And now let's jump to verse 15. And verse 15 says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend it and to what? To keep it. Did you see it? Here's God's first calling to Adam in terms of what he was going to do for a living. Poor Adam is not asked what he wanted to do when he grew up. Like you and I were asked when young. But God gives his first calling to Adam to be a gardener, to tend the garden and to keep it. But notice how the Lord planted the garden first. All right. He plants the garden first. And then afterwards, he invites Adam to participate in his creation. He does this very same thing in verse 19. Look at what God says. Out of the ground of the Lord, God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air. And God brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. <laughs> Look at this. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. I love it. So Adam gave names to all cattle, all right, to the birds of the air and to every beast of the field. That's what the Bible says. Did you see it again? We see God in creation, in action, creating something first and then inviting mankind, mankind Adam, to be a co-participant of his creation. That's deep. I don't know if you're catching this, but I hope you are. We see the Lord creating the beast of the field and then asking Adam, bringing him to put his creativity in action to naming every living creature. And I can imagine that God is speaking to Adam. I was like, hey, Adam, check it out. I, I, I created all these animals, but I don't have a name for them. Could you name them? Could, could you use your creativity to name? Could you help me finish my creation? I love that. 
And whatever that was its name, as the Bible says, that was it. And here God doesn't say, really? You're going to that, you're going to name that animal hippopotamus? Like how many peas does that name have? No, the Bible says that God respected the creativity of man and whatever Adam called each living creature, that was its name. Mm. Let me tell you something. God has created something in this earth and he has a calling for you. He has a vocation he wants you to be or he wants you to exercise. Again, listen to me. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you something. God has created something in this earth and he has a calling. He has a vocation. He wants you to be co-participant of his creation. Are you listening? God has given you not only the divine gift of being yourself, like we spoke last week, but also the divine gift of vocation. Not just simply a career, not just simply a job, but a vocation. More than a career, more than a job that pays the bills, more than making a living. Listen to this. God wants you to make a life. More than making a living. God wants you to make a life. I'll tell you what. Tell you what a lot of people do nowadays. They are being asked what they want to do in life. But they are not asked to ask the Lord what their calling is. What their vocation is upon their life. Many are caught up with getting a job that not only pays the bills, but that it's also going to allow them to buy a couple of nice cars, a truck, a boat. Hey, man, hallelujah, that's what I want. <laughs> and a big house with the pool in the back, right? So in their mind, because they want that, they are going to look for a position for an employment that will pay at least six digits. And that's why you see college students change their major all the time because they want to be a doctor for the money. But in the way they saw it, that it was too hard. That's why you see people graduating college and even a master's degree, but not practicing what they studied because they learned they did not like it. And those are the smart ones <laughs> because you also see people in a career, in a job for an entire life. But they drag themselves out of bed every morning because they hate going to work. They hate what they do. If you notice the career of those people who are well off, they have been successful. But they have become rich, not so much because that's what they were striving to become. If you look at them, rich people's life they were not like oh i really want to make that much money so i'm going to i'm going to do this they didn't do that what they didn't engage in whatever they did to become rich but they put their abilities their gifts and talents to creativity the people who are the most happy are those who are contributing the people who are the most happy at what they do are being co-participants of creation. The people who are the most happy in their life are busy making a life rather than making a living. The people who are the most happy in their life worship God in what in, 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 in co-participating in God's creation. In his book, How to Fly a Horse, by Ashen, he writes the following. The first patents were issued in Italy in the 15th century. The modern U.S. Patent and Trademark Office granted its first patent on July 31st, 1790. It granted its 8 millionth patent on August 16th, 2011. 8 million. The Patent Office 
does not keep record of how many different people have been granted patents. But one researcher has estimated that more than 6 million distinct individuals have received U.S. patents by the end of 2011. And their numbers are increasing. The first million inventors took 130 years to get to their patents. It took only eight years to gather the latest million inventors. The trend is unmistakable. In 1800, about one in every, in every 175,000 Americans was granted a first patent. But listen to this. In 2000, in the year 2000, one in every 4,000 Americans received one. Mercy. Not all creations get a patent, right? Books, songs, plays, movies, and other works of art are protected by what? By copyright instead, which in the United States is managed by the Copyright Office, part of the Library of Congress. Copyright shows the same growth as patents. In 1870, 5,600 works were registered for copyright. In 1886, the number grew to more than uh, 31,000. And Eisworth Spofford, the Library of Congress, had to plead for more space. And by 1991, there was one copyright registration for every 400 U.S. citizens. That is crazy. After surveying these statistics, MIT professor Kevin Ashton argues that although you may not have a patent, listen to this. This is what I really wanted to get to. Creativity is much more common than we think. Ashton writes, so when we start counting creators, we find that a lot of people create. Creating is not for an elite few. Mm, I'm going to say that again. Creating is not for an elite few. Creating is not extraordinary. Even if its results sometimes are. <laughs> Creation is human, he says. It is all of us. It is everybody. And you know what? I agree with. I agree with Ashen. Creativity is human. But you know why? Because we are made in the image and likeness of our creator. We are called by our creative God to pursue creativity in our vocation, in our job. All right, I'm done with that. God has called you to create. God has called you to be participant, co-participant of his creation. You have gift, you have talent, and God has, has a calling upon your life to put those things into a vocation. Not simply a, a, a job, not simply a career, and not simply to make a living, but to make a life. Number one, one thing that I want to leave with you. And number two, that's it. And I'm done here today, okay? I, I know you're crazy. You want to shut this down. I don't know what you're thinking, but I know God is speaking to you. Number thing, listen to this. Number two, number two, second thing. If you find yourself in your life that says, you know what? I think I have found my calling and I am leaving out my calling. I am leaving out my vocation. Let me tell you something. The second thing that I want to leave with you is the following. There will be doubt, D-O-U-B-T, doubt in the vocation that God has called you. Perhaps at the beginning, perhaps in the journey. Most, most often in the journey of exercising your vocation, of exercising creativity, of putting your gift and talents to work, in leaving now that, that calling that God has given you, there will be doubts in that journey. If you have recognized the calling, 
who have accepted the call of God to be his servants and to be co-participants with him in creativity and are executing a vocation. Let me tell you something. That will come your way. Doubt about whether what you are doing is actually what God has called you to do. And I tell you this because you have no idea how many times I've been 100% convinced that God has called me to be a pastor, to be a minister of the gospel. <laughs> But at the same time, sometimes I've looked up to heaven and said to the Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. And doubt has flooded my mind and doubt has come in. And I ask myself whether I'm cut out for this or not. Bible character that I can share this with, or that I want to illustrate this with, is the story of John the Baptist. The story of John the Baptist comes to mind. I mean, this guy was prophesied before his birth. The scriptures are talking about him. Him and Jesus' life is so alike. John is separated from God before his birth. He becomes a preacher and prepares the way for the Messiah. When John finally sees Jesus, he turns to his disciples and proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Let's look at it. You don't believe me, right? You're like, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Come on, man. Let's go there. Let's go to John. Chapter, uh, let's see here. Yeah, chapter 1. John chapter 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Come on. Okay. All right. John chapter 1. I hope you, 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 you're, you're looking for it as well. I'm almost there. 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 John chapter 1, verse 29 and 34 says the following. Come on, man. The next day. John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Verse 30. This is he who, whom I said, After me comes a man, all right, who is preferred before me, for he was before me. This is John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. Because he was before me. This is John speaking. Verse 31 says, I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32 And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove. Dove, dove, dove. And it remained on him. He, John saw that. John, John saw the Holy Spirit. Mercy. Verse 33. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, This is who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Is the Son of God. Wow. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. These are the words of John. How convinced does John sound when you read these verses? But eventually, doubt visits the life of John. And notice that doubt doesn't come when everything is, come, is going great in your life. Doubt does not come when everything is not going the way you hoped for. In your vocation, you will have highs, but you also have lows. And it is in those low moments that doubt knocks on your door... And doubt visits John the Baptist. You know where? When he's in prison. 
when his freedom is taken away, when he's no longer preaching and baptizing in the Jordan. In his own words, when you go to Matthew, mercy, chapter 11. Look at what Matthew chapter 11, verse 1 through 5 says. When John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? Wow! John! Wait a second, John! What happened to that confidence, brother? What happened to that confidence you had when you said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. What happened to the divine sign that God gave you to recognize the Messiah? Like, brother, you saw the Holy Spirit coming upon Jesus. What happened to the divine sign that God gave you to recognize the Messiah? What happened to the moment you saw the Holy Spirit descending upon him? When you baptized Jesus. You see, friend, oftentimes when in prison, mm, when in darkness, mm, when in trouble, when in doubt, man, we forget the past. We forget the calling that God has given us. Our vision is blurred. We cry out and we complain. We stop creating. We stop participating in creativity. We start drawing away from the Lord. When that happens, when we allow sin to get in between us and God, doubt comes in. When we forget our first love. That's why Jesus says to the disciples, right? Go back and report to John what you hear. And what you see, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Glory be his name. Hallelujah. God is calling you and I to be content creators for the kingdom of God. He has given the divine gift in us. But he hasn't promised that it's going to be easy. The musician, poet, songwriter Leonard Cohen used the following image for the creative process of writing. And he says the following. The creative process is like a bear stumbling into a beehive. <laughs> I'm stumbling into it and getting stuck and it's delicious and it's horrible and I'm in it and it's not very pleasant and graceful <laughs> and it's very awkward and it's very painful and yet there is something inevitable about it. All who teach and who preach scripture know the labor of studying the word and the delight. That's why I'm preaching this message with such delight of discovering its sweetness to present it to others. The creative process can be a fire in the bones that combines agony with a drive to complete the vision. Martin Luther. The source of this Protestant work ethic attacked medieval monasticism by saying that all work is divinely ordained. He says that you don't have to be a monk or a nun or a nun to serve God. The servant in the rich man's house mops floors for the glory of God. God didn't simply create the world and then he quit, right? Like God keeps creating. The Bible in Isaiah says that every second a new star is born. That's pretty cool. God keeps creating and invites us to join in that continuing work of creativity. In this way, 
Luther's thoughts on work is not so much a glorification of our human activity, talking about work, but work is rather, listen to this, work is rather a celebration or should rather be a celebration of the continuing creativity of God. That's what Luther says. Luther says that in your job, in your work, you should continue being creative and you should continue create something for the glory of God. I'll say that again. Work is not so much a glorification of our human activity, but rather a celebration of the continuing creativity of God. Mercy, I'll say that again. Work is not so much a glorification of our human activity, but rather a celebration of the continuing creativity of God. Hallelujah. Vocation comes from a Latin word, vocari, meaning we are called. We are called by God, not just in our jobs, but in everything we do to glorify God in all things, right? Our vocation, therefore, is not so much work as it is worship. We should do on Monday at the office what we do in church on Saturday. And that is glorify God. So, let me ask you. Are you living out the vocation God has given you? Are you living out the call the Lord has put upon you? Are you being a co-participant of creation? I hope so. One of the things that I admire about my second oldest brother, Eric, is that he is an excellent mechanic. He loves mechanic work. That guy could spend hours and hours working on his car, making a, a crooked chassis straight. I, I say this because I saw him do it. My first car was a 1986 Toyota MR2. Versus lovely, awesome mm, car that I hope to buy again one day. 1986 Toyota MR2. And being a 20-year-old car at the time, it would often break down. So I would run to my brother and ask him to fix it. And he would. And he would work with gladness about it. He knew something, he, you know something, he didn't go to school to study mechanics. When, when he worked, he was being creative. He would find a way to fix the problem. He contributes to creation by simply doing mechanic work. You have gifts and graces that come from God. Your work is not just for yourself, but so that you can better contribute to others. When Thomas More, author of the care of the soul was speaking to Duke students. The first question they asked was when I'm filling out my resume and going to job interviews, what do you think I should ask the company after interviewing? And Thomas Moore said, your last question ought to be, what are my chances for making really good friends here at this company? What will be the main place you'll be able to make friends? Right? He says, and maybe the goal of work ought to be friendship. From a Christian perspective, your work has value, not because it contributes to your well-being, but because it contributes to somebody else. My brother Eric, my brother the mechanic to me is more needed than a brain surgeon. When he puts my car back on the road, I am grateful. I am happy. I need him. And perhaps work is the way we discover our major dependency on other people. We are dependent every day on the kindness of strangers to help us get through life. We are a connected. We are in a connected web through, through our work with other people. And let's not forget that work contributes to the mundane but utterly necessary activity of earning a living. I pray that you will learn early that your life is not just your work and that you will find the sort of work 
whereby it is possible to say, I hope that you can find a job, a, a, a work, a vocation where you can say, this is a big part of my call from God, or this is a call from God. This is one way that I'm busy praising and glory God, glorifying God forever. And I pray you will be brought to the point where through your work, you will be able to say, here I am, Lord. Again, I hope that you find a job where you're busy praising and glorying God, glorifying God forever. And I pray you will be brought to the point where you, where you through your work, you can say to the Lord, Father, here I am, Lord. Use me for your honor and for your glory. Major points, the major things that God wants to say to you today is, I've given you the ability, the gift, the blessing to create, to be co-participants of my creation. Let's become partners. You have been made in the image of your heavenly father, of your creator. And as that, man, you have so much potential to waste your life in a job that simply pays the bills but where you're not making a life. The Bible says that before the foundation of this earth was set in place, but God thought of you. Before you were born, God thought of you. Let me tell you something. God didn't think of you and says, you know what, well, let's, let's figure it. Let's let, him, let's let him or her figure it out. But God has made a plan for you, Jeremiah 33. You're not just... You shouldn't be just out there wondering, or wondering, I should say, but looking for that calling. And let me tell you something. Sometimes the callings are temporary. Like students, right? They have a temporary calling. They are studying. They are reading books, whatnot. And that's their current vocation. So create. Because you have been made in the image and likeness of your heavenly father. And two, when doubt comes knocking on your door during your vocation, during your calling, look back. Look back. And remember the miracles and the blessings that God has given you. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you for this message, Lord. I pray for this person who is watching. I pray for my life, Lord. I pray for my vocation, the calling that you have given us, that we may execute it with gladness, that we may make a life more than simply making a living. Thank you, Lord, for listening to our prayers. In the precious name of Christ, we pray. Hey, believe it, live it, share it. God bless you. I'll see you next week on the third part, part three of this message series, The Divine Gift That God Has Given You. God bless you.